about Fermi with you, Yadish, where our genes to be very successful. So then it is not necessary. No, you don't need a separation of no. Okay. There should be separation of the high energy physics from the low energy physics. But there is no reason. The reason the energy levels should be split from the low energy physics. Well, according to Wilson, you can do it every time. Now the question is when is it useful? In other words, I argued on my first lecture that all the problems we work with are just big integrals or large number of variables. No one can stop you from integrating part of them and seeing what happens to the rest of it. So you can always do that, but you hope it will be useful. One occasion when it's useful is you can have a theory that is very weakly interacting at long distances. But if you define your coupling constant at short distances, the perturbation expansion will be very hard to carry out. So there will be huge logarithms. Use the normalization rule, you will be able to show in the end the problem is weakly interacting. So also, uh, the only way method I know most of the time is perturbation theory. So if you're weakly interacting, you can do it. If strongly interacting, uh, you've got to do something very clever like what Wilson did, the condo problem. You have to do a lot of numerical work to find the flow. But the idea is a good idea to have. I also think that if you have many competing instabilities, even at weak coupling, you may not know which way it's going. Then I gave an example yesterday that the RG will tell you, which is more important. So, should I put on the mic now? Yeah. Okay. So, today is shorter than usual. Right? Yeah, it's a little short. So, hour and 15 minutes, so hour and 30, that was the plan. Yeah. Starting with the news later. So, we're going to do till 10 30? Yeah. We're going to talk about 3D, right? And if, 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 you have, if you get a chance, we're going to be bringing the 3D glasses. Okay. So, if you, do, if you don't get the, the 3D glasses, uh, Shanker is going to have to stop at 2D. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, the only thing to remember from everything I told you so far is that in every theory, if you're interested in a certain region and you're not interested in the other kinematical regions, you should integrate out the variables that describe them to get an effective theory of the degrees of freedom that are interesting to you. Okay, so in each problem you must do something different. So in D equal to 2 Fermi system, I told you the Hamiltonian is k square over 2m minus mu. You pick the mu and you decide how many particles you want. So one way to write the mu is like this, k square over 2m minus k f square over 2m. Because this means for k less than kf, the energy is negative, the particle will be present. K is bigger than Kf, the level is positive, and you don't want to put a fermion when it costs you energy. The ground state of this Hamiltonian will contain all the states filled inside a circle of radius Kf. So if you want, you can write the energy as K minus Kf times K plus Kf <coughs> over 2m. And K minus Kf is what I call living K. In K plus Kf, I'm going to write K plus Kf as 2Kf. And you might say, it's not 2Kf. This is a Kf plus living K. But if you put another K here, that will make it K squared. And you, can, you already know from all the things I've done, if you get one more power of K, it's not relevant. That's why in the second factor, we just ignore the fact that this varies a little bit and call that as kf. And you cancel the 2, and this is called Fermi velocity times k. And I'm going to use units where Fermi velocity was 1. So the energy 
in the radial direction is k, where k is the distance from the Fermi surface, radial distance. So the action for this theory would be uh, but here's another point somebody brought up k up back is k dk p theta p omega of psi bar omega k p theta i omega minus k times psi of omega k Again, I'm going to replace this k here by kn. Why? Because the deviation is a little k. An extra little k here would make this k squared and make it omega k. And you know by rg, extra powers of k will be irrelevant by 1 power of s. So again, I put that as a kf. Then I absorb the kf in my fields. If you do that, that's just a constant, so I don't want to carry that around. I will define a new field in which the square root of kf is attached to this guy, not the square root of that guy. So that's the action you have. So what's the range of integration uh, for the angle? It is 0 to 2 pi. For omega, it's always plus to minus infinity. For k, that's the main thing. Is minus lambda to plus lambda. That means my world consists of states in this annulus. Everything else I'm not interested in. And in that narrow region, the energy is a linear function of this little k. That's it. A lot of Fermi oscillators, one at every angle, and it's got an energy that depends radially on k. So this is identical to what we did in one dimension. There, I have an index alpha that took two values. Now I have an angle theta that takes a continuous set of values. <coughs> so how do you do the RG? Well, let's do this in our head. So we don't want to repeat this. RG is just like in one dimension. You change the cutoff to lambda over s. By integrating out the modes outside in other words, you, you take this already small lambda, make it even smaller to lambda over s. <coughs> so if that's lambda over s, you eliminate some more guys. Since it's a Gaussian integral, the modes you eliminate don't talk to the modes you keep. So when you integrate them out, you'll get some constant. If you take e to the s, integrate the ones you don't like, they will give you a constant, and we don't care about the constant, you will be left with this theory. Then you rescale the momentum, you rescale the frequency, and you absorb it uh, in this guy and call it the new field, and the action comes to the same form. So that's a repeat exactly of what I did in one dimension. In fact, this is going to be true in any number of dimensions. I explained that to you. If you were living in three dimensions, then instead of B theta, you will have some integral over a solid angle on a sphere. But the scaling doesn't depend on this in angles on the Fermi sphere, it only depends on the one radial coordinate. So this RG is actually good for two, three, four, any number of dimensions. But I'm going to focus on two because two dimensions is where there's a lot of controversy on what is really going to happen. Uh, is the physics in two dimensions going to look more like three dimensions or more like one dimension? In one dimension, I showed you there is this great blood in the liquid it's got peculiar behavior of all the correlation functions. Yeah? What do you do when the Fermi surface is very different from the sphere? I will come to that. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Suppose it's elliptical. Then what you should do in that case is not use momentum as a measure. How you should use a cutoff in energy. So you should really integrate over a radial energy this will be the energy rather than momentum. So really what you want to do is go to states of low energy. Well, no, I mean, if, 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 you, if you go to some extreme, like you even, uh, like in the P wave, so sorry, the D wave, so conductor case, you have some neutral points, what, what, what do you do? Oh, uh, let, me, let me come to that later. First I will show you at least 
you can go from a sphere to anything reasonably like a sphere or ellipse and so on. Even multiply connected. Uh, I will talk about one example if I have time. Yes? The fact that the momentum dependent uh, terms, higher order, are not relevant, the, the, this fact is independent of the dimension. Yes. So let me come to that. So this is just reminding you how to do the RG for the non interactive field. Then I said you add this four Fermi interaction, which I would write in by a whole rotation like this. So I have one, a U that depends on these labels. Then let me write uh, three different momenta and three different frequencies. The fourth one is controlled by conservation. <coughs> so two is the shorthand for omega two, uh, theta two, and k two, etc. Now this also is identical to what we did in one plus one d yesterday. In other words, if you now do, do the tree level R G, the tree level R G, all you do is you just keep the variables you like and ignore the ones you don't like, so you will end up with this. So you have to rescale the momentum. If you rescale the momentum, so this becomes lambda, then it turns a new momentum, you get one inverse power of s for every one of these guys. And you rescale the frequencies, you get that. But s to the sixth dividing this will turn them precisely into new fields, because the new fields are s to the minus 3 over 2 times the old field. I got that here. Remember, if you do the RG here, if you can write them in terms of new omegas and new k's, you get three power <coughs> downstairs. So you give a three over two to this and a three over two to that. And here you got four fields and s to the minus six. So when you write them in terms of the new field, this action will look the same. So whatever you have here, it looks like u of four over s, three over s, etc., is the u prime. Then you do the series expansion, like I said yesterday. Nothing is different. All you have to understand is, why should it be different? There's only one coordinate k that depends, on which the energy depends. The discrete index, left and right, is replaced by a continuous label data. So nothing will be different. So you will come to the conclusion that u0 is the only guy that is relevant, is smart in. Everybody else is relevant. u0 means you take the function of some k's and omega that we call q as a shorthand for every k and every omega. You do a Taylor expansion like this. All these guys are developed. After rg, they will go to that divided by s, that divided by s squared. Ultimately, they're going to get wiped out. So this is also completely analogous to what I did yesterday. What's the difference? The difference is, yesterday I said what is left is u0 that can be left, right, left, right, or various other permutations. Today, what's going to be left over is that u0 is a function of the four angles. In other words, you're trying to define the theory by an interacting function. This is my coupling constant in my Lagrange like data action. It's labeled by the lines of the incoming and outgoing fermions. The omega and the k, you can choose to be zero for all of them. Because the coupling constant does not depend on the frequency or the deviation from the vertical surface, the radial direction, you choose them to be zero. So these are all zero, zero fermions. And this coupling constant will not go away. It won't get big and it won't get small and you got to figure out what to do with that. At three level, this is what you have. So this is very important. You get a lot in this theory from this three level, so it's important that you follow this. All you have to remember is this is a strict analog of the discrete version I did the other day. All right, now I ask the following question. We have, of course, you have to satisfy momentum conservation. So normal feeling is, whenever you have momentum conservation, 
If I knew one, two, and three, the fourth one would follow. But that is a big difference in this problem. It is true that if you pick vectors in a plane, if you pick three of the vectors, you can get the fourth one you need. <coughs> but these momenta are not coming from the plane. They're lying in a very, very thin shell around the Fermi surface. In fact, if this chalk, this chalk is perfect for that. If you think that this thickness is my cutoff lambda, the, the K vectors for the four particles live on this little circle. So if I pick the incoming momentum like that, and I pick the second incoming momentum like that, they add up to this total. The only way to get two other momenta to add up to this and also to lie on the circle is for them either to be identical with this or a permutation of this. That's what you should understand. If you pick two vectors from this circle, to get a given total incoming momentum, the outgoing momenta are individually equal to the incoming momentum. No choice, up to permutation. So that's a nice construction if you like, this may come in handy. If the total incoming momentum is this, what you're supposed to do is to draw a second circle whose center is displaced from this one by the total incoming momentum k. And where these two circles intersect, are the two possible values for the final moment. I mean, those two have to be the final moment. The only way to get this total is to either have this plus that or this plus that. And you can see that this momentum, that momentum are equal, that momentum, this momentum are equal. So this is a very, very interesting result. It tells you that if you want to satisfy momentum conservation, then you I just need to know as a function of the two incoming angles. Because the outgoing angles, both are fixed. In the case, it's the one equals to minus the two. Yeah, I'll come to that in a minute. It's a good point. I will purposely not repeating this question because it may confuse you right now. But in a general situation, like the typhoid group, if I know one and two, I know three and four. So the low energy physics of this theory is given by this function. In the case of a circular Fermi surface, if you pick one and two, it's very clear that the physics can only depend on the angle between one and two. So this is some function of theta, where theta is the angle between the two incoming fermions. So what we're learning is that if you want to study fermions at very, very low temperatures and very, very low energy, their dynamics is going to be controlled by a function that lives on this Fermi circle. That function is the function that Landau just postulated, which is called the Landau F function. If you try to study Landau theory, uh, you find this quite difficult because Landau is trying to do all of this, I don't know, 50 years ago without the formal machinery of the renormalization group. But with the machinery that we have, you can see that you will be driven to that conclusion automatically. So let's understand what this means. In quantum field theory, low energy physics is defined as, as the origin of momentum space. For example, in Euclidean field theory, the uh, Euclidean momentum P is measured from the origin. That's high energy, that's even higher energy, that's even higher energy. The origin is the low energy. So if you got four bosons scattering, the coupling constant can depend on the four momentum. But if you expand this in a power series, the power series will have u0, k1, q1, etc. You can show that u1 and u, they're all irrelevant. You only have u0. But u0 is the Taylor expansion of this function u at the origin. It's just one number. That's why in field theory, when you expand around the origin, there's only one number. That's because the low energy world collapses to a point. For Fermi system, the low energy world collapses to a surface. And functions on the surface will not go away no matter how much you denominate. That's the reason why in Fermi liquid theory, the coupling constants, if you like, are functions and not constants. 
So one thing you can do if you like, but it doesn't change anyway. You can expand these functions as some harmonics. F sub m, sometimes these F sub m are called the Landau parameters. And most of the time in practice, maybe F0, F1, and F2 will be enough to describe a lot of energy physics. So Landau's attitude was, uh, go find your F0, F1, and F2 by making some three measurements. Then you have a complete characterization of the low energy physics. In principle, you will need the whole function, but many interesting quantities you measure depend on the first two or three moments of this function. Now I come to one exception. Now this is not part of Landau theory, but it does come out of this machinery. It's connected to what a point E just raised. As long as one and two are generic values, and the total is this, three and four have to be equal to one and two. But take the case, exceptional case, where one is like this, and two is like this, and they add up to zero. When they add up to zero, three and four are not slave to this direction. 3 and 4 just have to be themselves equal and opposite, but in any direction you like. So in this constrained world where all momenta should come from the circle, there's another set of functions which you will need to know. It looks like 1 minus 1 and 3 minus 3. This we will call the function B. And B depends on theta 3 minus theta 1. Let's call that theta. So there's one set of functions. If you like, that's the interaction between Cooper pairs. Another set of functions, if you like, which we can call the forward scattering amplitude of the Fermi Because It is one in theory. So Landau theory talks all the time about forward scattering amplitudes. That is the BCS amplitude of the Cooper channel. And this theory is telling you those couplings will not be eliminated. So all of low energy physics consists of the knowledge of this function f of theta and the function b of theta, and they are both margin. So now we have to figure out the fate of these functions in the end by going beyond the <coughs> marginal coupling means it doesn't know whether it's going up or going down. You have to do some more work. That's what I want to do. But uh, if there's any question here in your mind, you should ask. It's a very important result. Yes. In the case of graph P, where you have a graph point, so you get you, you one parameter from the liquid. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. If the low energy physics is a point and deviation from the point, you are going back to the standard quantum field theory where you have a few coupling constants. The low energy physics is a manifold, in the typically a sphere or an ellipse, then functions on that ellipse have to be known because no matter how low your energy is, you can move all over that sphere or ellipse, right? That's why that's the novelty. You need coupling functions and not coupling constants. But that's why we have to ask how are we going to do the normalization in this problem when I'm dealing with functions. So it was a concern to me at this point what these functions would do when I start drawing diagrams. But you will see, uh, if you just proceed, you will find in the end that it's not so bad as I thought. Very much like going through this tunnel. You know, I've heard all kinds of things about it. It's not so bad. <laughs> Same thing. Um, <laughs> stop worrying and do it. So I'll tell you what happens next. But you also know what I'm trying to do. Yes. Yes. Oh, so yes. you showed here's the instability for the two reflecting channel. Um, not instability. Right now it's marginal. That means it won't get big. It will stay where it is. At the tree level, there is a coupling that we can call the superconducting coupling. But we don't say this a dangerous variable because we don't know if it's going to get bigger or smaller under further RG. Right? right now it looks like it won't change at all. So my question was going to be that I know we haven't included the spin, but is there a, a magnetic channel as well? Yeah. So if you have spin, then spin is completely, completely unconstrained by the kinematics of low energy physics. So you've got to start spin labels. If you've got two incoming fermions, they can either form a singlet or they can form a triplet. Right? So you will have two different amplitudes. You have two different Fs and you have two different Vs due to spin. The spin doesn't do anything very interesting. This is really the interesting kinematics in momentum space. Then you can have flavors and everything else you want. All right, so if you, have, if you guys have been leveling with me and telling me that you're following this, 
then I think <coughs> you will follow my next step. See, remember, it doesn't hurt to remind people one more time what they do. If you have a function that looks like x plus y to the fourth, and you don't like x, you don't like y, so this is like modes inside lambda over s, this is modes outside lambda over s, and you have some four Fermi interaction. I put a minus sign for boson with the flat form you're used to. Then I said you can write e to the minus x4 for free because that doesn't depend on y at all. Then you have a lot of stuff in the top, right? You've got x cubed, 3x cubed y plus 3xy cubed, uh, I don't know what, 6x squared, y squared, y to 4. You have all these things you have to integrate. And you can integrate them in perturbation theory. So there should be a number in front of all of this, like a coupling constant. That's what allows you to do it perturbatively by bringing down the exponential in a power series in you and doing each integral. Mm -hmm. uh, I also forgot that's always a quadratic term. Mm -hmm. So e to the minus x squared, <coughs> e to the minus y squared. What I have done is just this. That's called the three level calculation. That consists of just setting equal to zero the y variable. That is a part of the old action that control that contained your x term. This is that. You keep that and you rescale that and find what it does, and you find it marginal. That means that coupling was not going up or going down. So you have to now bring these guys down in a power series in you, do the integrals over y. You'll get some function of x, write it upstairs as an exponential, that may modify the export term. Then you've got to see then what's the further change in the interaction. And I told you yesterday that the change in any interaction, the delta of that interaction, is obtained by drawing the following diagrams. You draw one diagram. So let's find the delta in F. So F, you remember, is theta 1 going to theta 1 amplitude. And the omega and k are zero for everybody. That means I pick the four external momenta to lie on the Fermi surface. And I pick the frequencies to be zero because this function does not depend on frequency. So you might as well evaluate it when the frequency is zero. It doesn't depend on how far you are from the Fermi surface. You might as well evaluate it on the Fermi surface. What do you do? Now what about this? What's in this loop? So let me just take one diagram. You remember, this is the Fermi momentum. That's my cutoff above the Fermi momentum. That's the cutoff below the Fermi momentum. I want to integrate a very thin shell here and a very thin shell here. So that at the end of the day, this annulus has become slightly smaller to that new value. In other words, I'm now going to integrate an infinitesimal amount of momentum, not a thickness from lambda over s to lambda. With s, the thing I call s is 1 plus epsilon. So you want to take a small sliver. So these momenta have to lie here or lie there. They are the ones who are being eliminated. They are my y variables. So it's like Feynman graphs, but it's not edited. It's the ones you don't like in this step of elimination. So let me call the momentum k as whatever is writing here. And let me call omega as its frequency. And that is a U, I mean, that's an F here. Uh, let me see. This is a K. Now you can see that that's a K here. There is no momentum transfer or frequency transfer here. That's also K and omega. Don't worry about what happens at the end. Just look at this guy, what you're doing now. You are doing exactly the same integral like the other day. Uh, that is, in theta, you can integrate this case of vectors lying in the shell. So theta is part of that. So if you like, it's got a radial part and an angular part. But the problem is the denominators, the two propagators, are the same. If the two propagators are exactly the same, because there's no momentum transfer of any kind, the omega integral will kill that. That's 
the pole of this is at what, what omega equal to minus ie. The pole is also omega equal to minus ie. So whatever the sign of e is, you cross the contour the opposite way, you get zero. The double pole does not contribute. So this integral is zero. Now let's do the second problem. Uh, you know, the second term in the Feynman diagram will look like this. It will have theta 1 coming in here, theta 2 going there. It will contain a minus sign, but I'm not very interested in that. You will see why. It will look like that at the exchange diagram. But now, this frequency is the same, but the momentum is not the same because you've gone from 1 to 2. Remember, 1 could be there and 2 could be there. 1 to 2 is a huge momentum of order k. Particular large momentum. Your job is to take that large momentum, add it onto this guy, and get this guy. So this is going to be k plus q, where q is this momentum. <coughs> but remember, so then we have that, then we have e of k plus q. By the way, my previous model is exposed go through this in pitiless detail. So if you don't write everything down, you can uh, download a copy and read the details. So maybe you should just try to follow this as best as you can. Now, what do we expect from this? We are trying to find something that looks like u squared or f squared or d lambda over lambda, schematically of this form. The u squareds are coming from the two ends. The d lambda comes from the dk, which is our thickness d lambda. And the 1 over lambda typically comes from doing these integrals. And d theta we think is some integral like 2 pi. So that's what doesn't work in this problem. Because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to go from the shell below the Fermi surface to the shell above the Fermi surface. But I have to get from, in fact, let me draw it to scale. This is not really the scale. The real drawing to scale would look something like this. Remember, the poles have to be on opposite sides. So take one pole here. You want to add a momentum Q so that you end up there. If you add a momentum Q to this point, you end up there, but that's not the reason allowed for the second momentum. So normally, if all momenta can take all values, you can have any momentum transfer you want. K plus Q is an allowed momentum. But now everybody lives in the thin shell. You have an arrow of fixed length Q and you're walking around trying to fit the arrow where it will fit. So it will take you from this circle to that circle. You'll find that only two places you can do it. You cannot do it anywhere else. It won't work. Therefore, this angle d theta is limited to a very tiny range. The momentum that you can live with, initial momentum has to be precisely at this angle or at this angle. So d theta itself is proportional to d lambda. So the whole flow is proportional to d lambda squared. That means there is no first derivative, there is no derivative, and the thing doesn't flow. So it doesn't flow for a kinematical reason that it's impossible to get diagrams with any weight so that you can absorb this large momentum of order kf and go from one shell you're eliminating to the other shell you're eliminating. It's all coming from the fact you live on these two shells. There's the phase space that kills the flow. The third diagram I don't want to draw because it's going to be the same argument over and over again. You could draw this diagram from 1 minus 1 to, uh, I'm sorry, 1, 2, 1, 2. You can again try to do the kinematics here. That's what I don't think I should do over and over. You'll find the same argument. That if you knew this momentum, okay, maybe. Let's take this problem. One and two combined to some intermediate states going back to one and two. What's the problem there? So the intermediate momenta, this and this, if you call this as k and omega, uh, let's call the incoming momentum as p, that's the sum of one plus two, then this should be p minus k and minus omega. <coughs> because the incoming frequencies add up to zero, so these frequencies will now be opposite <coughs> because they're both particle lines. The momenta should add up to incoming momentum. 
So again, you have a constraint that you want two momenta, both lying on this inner outer annulus, adding up to a total P. So for that also, you can ask, for this momentum, what should I add to get that momentum? And you'll again find this momentum has to lie in a very narrow angle. Or that is another, another way to think about it. If someone tells you, give me the geometrical way to solve the constraint, this is a third sort of the correct answer. You draw a circle like that, you go a distance B, you draw another set of concentric circles there. Wherever they intersect are allowed values for K and the other K. So these two will add up to give you the total momentum. There are lots of intersection points, but some of them are not allowed because this one is allowed because you are intersecting a circle below the Fermi energy with a circle above the Fermi energy. That's allowed because the poles will be in opposite directions. But things like this are kinematically allowed, but the omega integral will kill them because in this case, both energies are above the Fermi energy. You can have the same sign. But the point is, don't kill yourself over this diagram because its phase space measure is d lambda squared. So what we find is that at one loop, the f function does not flow. And you can, yes? What if p is zero? Pardon me? What if p is zero? Ah, we'll come to that. That p is zero is again the PCS problem, right? That will control the flow of the v function I call V. So we have to come to that. So I'm taking generic values of so P in which case this one happens. And we can draw higher loops and it's a little bit of work. If I have time, I'll tell you why you can avoid that work. We'll find there is no flow. Theory has simply no flow of the F functions. And the F functions are really fixed point functions. And F, F for theta can have any value you like. So lambda theory, if you like, has one strictly marginal coupling function f of theta, which will not get big, which will not get small, to any order in the particular expansion. That means your fixed point contains a function f of theta. The low energy physics is controlled by that function. In every experiment, in every material you have that God has given you, you've got to make a measurement of f of theta somehow. Or you can try to calculate it from microscopic Coulomb interaction. You can go back to string theory, wherever you want to start. Your job is to end up with f of theta. Landau's attitude was, uh, let this start by measuring moments of the data from the For example, Pierce was talking about the mass at the Fermi energy, m star. m star is controlled by one of these f functions. So if you knew the bare m and you knew the physical m from specific heat measurement, you can deduce one of these f and find f1. Or if you measure the compressibility of the fermion system, you can show the compressibility compared to that of non interacting fermions will give you F0. So some people think uh, this Fermi liquid fixed point is a non interacting theory. This is, of course, very misleading. It is not a non interacting theory. Non interacting, what are the F functions doing? They are interactions. It is just a theory in which there are no, nothing forcing you out of the fixed point, so it's a fixed point. It's not a non interacting fixed point. That's why there's a whole function f you have to measure. But I'll come to the question that uh, right, you had the question about opposite momentum. That's again looking at the fate of what we would call the V functions. The function V of theta is defined as follows V of theta <coughs> is defined as theta 1 minus theta 1. Point theta 3, point theta 3. This is a different function. It's a function of a totally different angle. Because here, there's no question of the angle between the two incoming vectors. That angle is pi. It's the angle between this incoming guy and that outgoing guy. Yes? Question. Here, you're doing differential RT. So the d lambda over lambda is very thin. So it's a higher order. So you have d lambda over lambda right. squared. But suppose I do chunk RT. Yeah. So I, I always take my lambda, I always integrate from lambda over 2 to lambda. Right. And so then I'll get a different flow, but the, 
we, we expect that uh, it doesn't matter how you do the RG. At long yeah, I think so. The probably I understand how you respond. First of all, something being the lambda squared may suggest that some of the trouble is with taking a very, very thin shell. So what you, after all, when you begin, there are no shells. Momentum goes all the way to infinity. You can decide to integrate everything from Planck momentum down to a few kp of the Fermi surface in one shot. You can do that, and then that will be your starting U. But at some point, you're going to come to the small cutoff. Mm -hmm. Then I can show you that if it's not d lambda over lambda, it cannot be any better than lambda over k. The extra factor will look like lambda over k. If the, how big a chunk can you pick at the end? No bigger than lambda, right? So when lambda is going to zero, this thing will vanish. Maybe that's, that's a very useful point. You don't have to differential RD and try to bite out big chunks. But if I allowed you to be anywhere on this circle, or anywhere on that circle, I don't even tell you to lie in the sliver. Even then, it's going like lambda over k. So there is just no room. So this will, in fact, stop flowing. Okay, now I take the fate of this guy, V. So what should you do? You should do theta 1, and you should do theta 3. And you can draw this diagram, minus theta 1, minus theta 3. There is a momentum transfer Q here. And you can see the same argument. This is K, this is K plus Q. Both have the light in the shell, and it won't fit except at certain angles. This guy will match. The cross diagram will also match. <coughs> but I will just tell you one diagram that does not match. You might think it's all over, but there's one interesting diagram that does not match. That's worth uh, really understanding. So it's got this diagram. It's got this cross diagram, if you like. But let me focus on the last guy. That is this one. So let's look at this guy here. Theta 1 minus theta 1, theta 3 minus theta 3, theta minus theta, omega minus omega. Or if you like, some momentum k and minus the momentum k because these two boys are bringing in zero momentum. So what, what do we have? here when we do the integral. Is there a restriction? The trouble, if you want to remember in one word, is the following. You are trying to eliminate states that lie either in this shell below the Fermi surface or that shell above the Fermi surface. You are prepared for the fact that the shell is very thin, dk, but you expect the angle to run over a robust set of values from 0 to 2 point. But in all the graphs, the angle itself runs over a very infinitesimal region. That's why none of these guys are flowing. But I will show you, this is one diagram which doesn't respect that. So let's see why. I want to pick momenta in the shell, right? So let's look at the propagators first. One propagator will look like I omega minus E of K. <coughs> the other propagator will look like minus I omega minus E of minus K. But all these problems with time reversal symmetry, E of minus K and E of K are the same. So then let me drop minus sign. Then it's obvious the poles lie in opposite directions. Because this is omega minus E, that's minus I omega minus E. That tells you that if you pick a point here, you can always find the opposite point also in a shell you're eliminating. So if you pick this vector K, you don't have to worry that the other guy will not lie in the shell you're eliminating because the other guy is minus k. And you're always integrating k and minus k at the same time. So this can wander all over this circle and the other will follow the opposite side. And that can also wander wherever it wants and the spot then will follow opposite. So you get the kinematics it's such that we don't have to worry about keeping both in the shell because if k is in the shell, so it's minus k. The only thing you may worry is you want a lot of integration measure, but maybe poles lie on the same side. The poles lie on opposite sides. For the reason I gave you, the omega is reverse, reversed, but the energies are not reversed. E of minus k is e of k. This tells you time reversal is very important. 
for this to happen. And if you follow the limits of superconductivity, time reversal is very important. So what will you have at this vertex? This is the only time I'm going to write this carefully. This is going to contain the V of theta minus theta 1. And there is a V of theta 3 minus theta at the top. Then you have to do V theta integral, V k integral, V omega integral. So let's try to do this in our head. E of k is just little k. And e of minus k is also little k, right? Now you guys agree that this looks like 1 over omega squared plus k squared. If you do the omega integral from minus to plus infinity, you will get 1 over mod k. 1 over mod k is just lambda because I'm sitting either here or there, both of which have mod k equal to lambda. And this integration is just d lambda. And d omega integration I've already done for you. So I claim that we find dv of theta 1 minus theta 3 dt. dt is shorthand for lambda dv lambda. It's a logarithmic derivative. That is equal to integral 3 of theta 3 minus theta and 3 of theta minus theta 1. In theta, I'm not worried about factors of phi or anything, but I do remember there's a minus sign here. So what you find is that the function d of theta actually flows. And the flow of the function depends upon itself. You know, you are used to things like uh, du dt is minus u squared or plus u squared or whatever. It's like that, except it's, everything is integrated. You've got a whole set of functions. So at this point, what you can do, if you look at the nature of these integrals, it is begging you to do the following expansion, P of theta is e to the i and theta times pn. If you do that, then this Fourier coefficients, because it's a convolution integral, will decouple. And you'll find each vn flows independently. It looks like some constant that might depend on m. That's the m squared. So this is the final result of the RT. See, it's not too bad. You have an infinite number of couplings. They are the harmonics of the interaction function between Cooper pairs, a function of the angle of scattering. And if you made the measurement of V of theta, you can do the Fourier analysis and give me the V of m. This is the final flow. So there is a flow at one loop. So what does the flow tell you? Well, all of them seem to have similar flows, so you pick any one of them that you like. It says dv dt is minus v squared. And it doesn't seem to depend very much on what m is. So take something like dv dt is minus v squared. This means, because of the origin in V space, if you start at a positive value, dV dV is negative, you'll come down. But once you hit zero, of course, you won't go past zero because this guy will vanish and you will stop. But if you start at a negative value, then minus V squared will change V more negatively. It will go like this. So what that tells you is, if you have any interaction, this m is just the angular momentum of the Cooper pair. The Cooper pair with angular momentum m, if they have an attractive interaction, it will get bigger and bigger and bigger. No matter how small attractive interaction is a source of instability. So if any repulsive interaction, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. In fact, if you integrate this thing, you know, you've got dv dt is v minus v squared or dv or minus v squared dt, you can integrate that to show v of t is v of 0 divided by 1 plus v of 0 t. 
that's the solution to integrating this. V of zero means when you start your argument. And T is the logarithm of your final cutoff to some initial cutoff you had. So this tells you to have repulsive interaction. By the time you reduce your cutoff more and more, it goes like 1 over T. It means the repulsion vanishes logarithmically. So repulsive attractions have renormalized downwards. This was known a long time back. It's called the Anderson and Mora found this result. That the Coulomb attraction gets scaled up when you come to the narrow band. On the other hand, if you have any attractive attraction, maybe due to phonons, no matter how small, you'll get amplified. This is what I meant by the power of the RG. It tells you big couplings can get small, small couplings can get big. So the slightest repulsion between fermions in any angular momentum channel leads to the instability of the fermion. Now, do not confuse the sign of this function's dm to the sign of the original interaction, which we know is repulsive. You might say, look, I know Coulomb interactions are repulsive, so all the b's are going to be positive. That's not correct. Coulomb attraction is some input interaction you put into the problem with all the momenta in the world. You've eliminated all of them. You got an effective theory where the final interactions are obtained by summing all kinds of graphs, if you like. So in fact, there is no guarantee that just because the Coulomb interaction is repulsive, uh, B sub 39 is not negative. In fact, there's a theorem the own Latin there that says some of the B's will always be negative. That means every Fermi system with any interactions will always be a superconductor. But it could be at some incredibly absurdly low temperature. So Lakoff's theory is based on the primary assumption that there's adiabatic continuity between non-interacting fermion and interacting fermion. Well, if you go to the BCS state, you don't have adiabatic continuity. So Landau postulates that there is no discontinuity between the interacting theory and the non-interacting theory. So that assumption is actually invalid, but it's invalid probably under very extreme conditions. Maybe you'll have to go to 10 to the minus 15 Kelvin before some tiny little coupling begins to assert itself. So when you use land out theory, you've got to remember that it's always in principle. It's this name. Okay, so you can see now what the RT does for you. It starts with no special assumptions about anything. With the most general interaction, including six fermions, you find six fermions don't matter. And only the four fermions matter. And among the four fermions, so momentum dependence and frequency dependence do not matter at low energies. Then you're left with two kinds of functions. The F function, the Landau light, in terms of which you can compute many things like mass and susceptibilities. And the V function, which Landau doesn't like because the V function is going to make the Fermi liquid unstable. But the input values of V may be very, very small if you start at such a tiny V and the flow is very tiny for tiny V, you can go to very, very low temperatures before the coupling becomes sufficiently important to destabilize the Fermi Yes? Question. So if you go back to the to that suppression factor, yeah. it's kind of like a large 1 over n, right? The yeah. lambda divided by kf. But uh, for any finite lambda, they, I can make it very small, the ratio lambda over kf, but yeah. still, it, it, you know, say 1 over a million. But now when I integrate, if I get a, a, a differential equation, d, df dl is equal to f times the 1 over n. If I integrate it, and that uh, coefficient is positive from the one over n, I'm going to get a growth exponential. <coughs> so I'm going to get uh, something like, uh, uh, at the end of the day, lambda over kf <coughs> times uh, that ratio, the t, log uh, lambda final over yeah. the initial. Right. So if I take as my lambda final, something of the order of temperature, yeah. I get that the t, t final is uh, log uh, lambda divided by uh, temperature. And I exponentiate it in the solution of the differential equation. At the end of the day, I get lambda kf times lambda divided by t. Mm -hmm. So if the temperature is small enough, so if I run my RG for long enough, right. I'm always going to get that coupling to grow. I don't think so. Uh, I have to think about it with you. But in the end, if your lambda is going to zero, I'm trying to show that in the end, when lambda goes to zero, everything will stop flowing. Right, but when you say lambda is actually the lambda uh, zero, right? Lambda initial. 
No, 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 no. At every stage, you keep on doing the renormalization. The, the lambda that I put in is not the lambda initial. It is the current value of lambda. Oh, okay. So when you say that the, the one over n, it's actually yeah. also changing. Yeah, it's a current, it's a so running it's a value of lambda. lambda. Divided by chaos. Yeah. So if your lambda at some stage in the game has become very, very small, there's just going to be no flow. Okay. All I'm trying to establish is that in the end, if you renormalize far enough, everything will stop flow. What will happen is, uh, I'm ignoring certain flows. You're saying some things can flow because in the initial stages, lambda is not so small. But I'm saying they will all come and they will all stop. Everything will stop. When lambda goes to zero, they will just stop at some value. That's the, that's the fixed point. I'm just demonstrating the stability of fixed point to show there is no flow. Yes? If your Fermi surface was actually a very small piece of this circuit of order of a length of order below. If this was your firm surface. You mean the whole surface? The whole or the surface thickness? was a tiny piece, yeah. You mean the thickness? No, no, the length. The length of the load. So imagine that you just have uh, only one piece of this disk, and you fill up only this piece. Yeah, then you have, you, have, you have to think a little bit. I think you're talking about different kind of geometries of the Fermi surface you might have, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'll talk about a few, but I haven't thought about every possible geometry. So I'm not giving you an answer for, I would say, I can say with confidence, but connected Fermi surfaces in, in any number of dimensions. You can do essentially what I did. And if you got two ellipses, for example, you can do the same thing. You started normalizing towards the elliptical Fermi surface. The only difference, this I discussed at some length in my paper, you must take contours of fixed energy. Momentum is no longer good. So you eliminate shells of fixed energy. Uh, then you will get I omega minus the energy that you're keeping. And you will rescale omega in this energy the same way. And then you will find, uh, if you got two particles, one and two, going into three and four, you will have to intersect two ellipses. And then you will also find that 1 plus 2 has to go to 1 plus 2 for the same reason, even if they come from ellipses. The only difference is you cannot say that the u of theta 1 and theta 2 is not a function of theta 1 minus theta 2 if you're sitting on an ellipse. So that doesn't have circular symmetry. So you will have some lambda function, f of now to angles that depend on the two incoming momentum, not just the difference between them. Everything else will be the way I said. Likewise, in the BCS flow, you can come to this stage even there. But these won't look like differences anymore. You will, you will say we have theta 3, theta, we have theta, theta 1, we have theta some angle running around the ellipse. You cannot separate it using Fourier transform because you don't have rotation there. Uh, yeah. Uh, in terms of this picture, uh, what does the Pomeranjic instability correspond to? Oh, Pomeranjic instability corresponds to some f function being less than minus one, more negative than minus one. I know. But how do you see the, this instability in terms of? Oh, how do you see this? Well, the way to approach this theory is to say, okay, I've got a fixed point here, right? In the end, you come to a fixed point, you've got an end function. That doesn't mean you are done. It's not enough to show it's a fixed point. You want to calculate at the fixed point, right? Let's see how we will calculate at the fixed point. So it turns yeah, this is something very important. Not only can we get to a fixed point at very, very low temperatures, we can actually solve the theory at the fixed point. For example, suppose someone says, calculate for me the psi bar, psi bar correlation functions. Then you know you start drawing diagrams. It's that, plus that, plus that, maybe plus that, and so on. Now you will find out, if you look at the fact that these moments are all lie in a very thin shell, you can show that diagrams like this are suppressed by lambda over here. The time I will tell you. The only diagram
diagrams that remain are these repeated bubbles that you have. And everywhere here, there is some F function. In fact, in this integral, this is called the, the compressibility, you will find it is this bubble divided by 1 plus or minus, I don't know, F0 times the bubble. So that is how, I forgot, uh, I think in the end when you do the bubble, it probably comes out with a plus sign. Anyway, this is how, using the Landau interaction, you can actually compute a response function. It's not perturbatively in that. This is not perturbation theory in that. In fact, this is perturbation theory in lambda over kf. In fact, the lambda over kf is very small, is what makes you limit yourself to just these bubbles, which you call RPA bubbles. The non-bubble diagrams, you can ignore them previously, but without any good reason. Now you can ignore them, because when lambda goes to zero, you don't need anything else to say these are not important. So you can actually sum these bubble sums and get this answer, and if you look at Landau's description of his own Fermi liquid theory, he does some self-consistent mean field like arguments to find response functions. They all look like free field divided by one plus f function times free field. They all come from doing this geometric sums. So let's understand what we are doing here. We take a general Fermi Fermi on problem with some bad coupling, maybe Coulomb interaction. We say goodbye to that theory. And we join the theory later when all the modes have been eliminated except for a very, very thin shell. If you got the stomach for it, you can calculate f of theta. You get that by formally doing all the Feynman diagrams, which contain every momentum except those in the remaining phase space. Whether you do it or don't do it and start arbitrarily, you have a function f of theta. And I'm saying that given that function, you are not ready to go home yet because you still have an interacting theory. It's not a free field theory. But the interacting theory can be solved because the diagrammatics of this theory is involving this bubble sums. And the F functions will determine that. I wanted to mention a uh, connection between this. Yes. Yeah. Let me ask a question because then suppose that I have uh, two skin species. Uh, an and uh, there is a form of satellite towards a magnetic system. But now we started with a fixed point, right? And the, our S0 mm -hmm. is a fixed point for a uh, spin unpolarized system. Is it S0 or does it have the land of interactions in it? No, it, it, so it has the land of interactions. Okay. Yes. But now when we, when we took the quadratic piece of the, the action, that quadratic piece didn't have any magnetization in it. Mm -hmm. So the two Fermi surfaces for up and down were the same size. Yes. Now, in the, so we start from a fixed point. Oh, but you're saying that actually the fixed point includes includes the interaction. Yes. So it's not just the free. The no, that's the thing. The yeah. common mistake is saying land up theory is a free theory. It's no. a free theory where we're drawing diagrams. The point is, it's it's not free, but it's manageable and it's very interesting. Let me take a poll. How many people have seen one over n expansion in your life? Okay, quite a few. So it's worth mentioning. The connection to 1 over n expansion. So in the 1 over n expansion, if you have some problem that looks like this, the action for that may be, say, Dirac theory with some label i that goes from 1 to n. And you got some coupling constant, which we like to write g over n, psi bar i, psi i, sum over i squared. In this theory, you take the limit for very, very large n. You divide by n because there are n squared terms here and n terms here. And if you did not divide by n, this term will dominate this by so much that it's no interest in physics. In this theory, for very large n, someone says, calculate for me, psi bar, say, psi bar, say, correlation function. You would say, if you write this out, it looks like psi bar i, psi i, psi bar j, psi j. That means incoming lines ij are the same as the outgoing lines ij in this theory. So take some problem where i comes in, j comes in, then i has to go up and j has to go up. And try to calculate. First you will have some coupling constant from the Lagrangian, which is g over f. Then you start drawing diagrams 
So I has to come in. J is coming in. And the I and J have to get out. So one way is I can get out like that. J can get out like that. And the loop will have some other index K, which is running freely around the loop. So this will have D over N squared times another N coming from the free sum over the root index. So it's also the same size as the leading term. But let's draw another possible diagram in which I comes in, gets into the loop, and gets out here. And J comes in, stays in the loop, and gets out there. In this, there is no free summation over anybody because the index I has gotten into the loop. It has to come out of the other side. So this guy, you can see, would be down by power of 1 over n because you have 1 over n here, to 1 over n here, and no sum over n. And likewise, you can show the third diagram that I can draw here. Also does not have a free summation because if i and j come in, i and j have to go out. So of the three diagrams I can draw at one loop, this guy remains. And I claim, if you go to higher and higher orders, you'll find only the repeated bubble here survives, and all the other guys are negative. So what's the analogy to the Fermi liquid problem? The Fermi liquid problem is the following. Uh, take the problem when you have a small bandwidth, not yet zero, and you divide this region into a large number of regions whose thickness is lambda in both directions. Lambda the lambda patches. You can make n patches where n is roughly k over lambda. What kind of scattering amplitudes do I have? I told you if you come at some angle theta 1 and theta 2, you have to go at the same angle theta 1 and theta 2. So this label for the patch i is preserved in the scattering. So it looks like a large end theory where the index, isospin index is spectacular. That label is concerned. So in certain diagrams where you have, you come in with some angle, you go out with the same angle, you can do a large end summation. On the other hand, if you come in with some angle and you go out with the other angle, if you do this, if you come with theta 1, Theta 1 goes inside and comes here. Theta 2 goes out there. You can see these are like the bad diagrams. So whenever an external label goes into a diagram, you lose the power of n. So what you want the internal labels unconstrained by anything to remain. So this is why the Landau theory is a large n theory. Not only that, n can be as big as you like. Normally, when you say large n, maybe you assume three angles, you've got three, and you think one over three is small. Here, n is equal to k of over lambda, and you cut off, reduce the cutoff as much as you like, the k of over lambda is as big as you like. So you can really do the large n theory. The so lambda theory in the limit is really n going to infinity. That's also another reason why, when I found the flow on one loop, if it vanished one loop, you'll never have a flow. Because the property of large n theory is that the entire flow comes from one loop diagrams. There is no flow coming from higher loop diagrams in the large n limit. That's how I know that if you want to waste your time doing higher loops, you won't get anywhere. So that's the connection with the large n theory. Uh, one final thing I want to mention, if you're really following this very, very carefully, there's a point I want to hit with the people for all people which is take a diagram like uh, this one. Two particles come in at theta 1. That goes at theta 1. That goes at theta 2. That goes at theta 2. We draw a loop here. Is this diagram present in the final theory or not? what we are not thinking about. In other words, I claim the final answer will look like many repeats of this. That will be the full four-point function. Now, when I did the RT, I said this diagram is zero. Remember that? That's because I said 
uh, this is k and omega, that's also k and omega. But actually, that's for the purpose of renormalizing the coupling. But if you're trying to do, what I'm trying to say is in the end, when you got a theory with a cutoff, now you must change your mind. These diagrams are not renormalization diagrams. These are standard Feynman diagrams. In your tiny world with a tiny cutoff, where all integrals go from zero to lambda. They're not in the shell you're eliminating. They're in the shell that you're keeping in the end. So you do the standard diagrammatics, but keep the momenta in the tiny band. There, uh, even though theta 1 and theta 2 have to be exactly equal on the Fermi surface, as long as you've got a band with lambda, 1 and 2 can differ by a tiny momentum q, which is much smaller than lambda. Then you can show in these propagators, the 1 over omega minus e of k and 1 over i omega minus e of k plus q. With a tiny little q, it's possible to take a point just below the Fermi surface to a point just above the Fermi surface. So don't confuse the renormalization diagrams in which the momenta are all in a cutoff from the last thing you do when you've got your fixed point theory with a very, very tiny cutoff when you start doing diagrammatic, those momenta are inside my cutoff. And now I'm integrating momenta inside my cutoff, including zero momentum on the Fermi surface. Then a tiny Q can take this guy below the Fermi to above the Fermi, and the integral will be non-zero. That's how we get all the diagrammatic contributions. The subtlety of omega limit, Q limit, applies to the Feynman diagram to the final theory. They don't apply to the flow equations. The flow equation, the two momenta are far from the Fermi surface at lambda and minus lambda for the Fermi surface, and tiny q doesn't make any difference. All right, I think I don't want to talk anymore. I think a few minutes left, I would like to ask a question. Yes? Uh, is there a way that the, the flow under the, the, the form of CMs, the flow of the VMs, yeah. uh, is not the government? I mean, it's not independent. So, is it is it possible? I mean, why are the VMs? CMs, C, the CMs yeah. are dependent on somehow. Well, of the one loop diagram, the each VM can be decoupled. They do not mix. In the large end limit, also they do not mix. Initially, if you do the big chunk renormalization. So, what's the what's the reason for this? Is it the fact that you have a connected surface? Uh, no, I think if you have the topology of this diagram, <laughs> like this, in this one they really will decouple. If you start adding other things like this, then they will get mixed up. But in the large end limit, that's the only diagram you have. So in the large end limit, for large end you should remember just means lambda over k at right to zero in the limit. Uh, the VMs are in fact independent. Yes? Uh, if you have a Fermi sphere, then for certain point of k, that the Fermi end and the energy goes to zero. Then after you apply for the spherical case and the uh, elliptical case, you will not apply. So well, you mean if the Fermi energy is actually zero? No, no. Uh, for certain point of k, the yeah. energy is zero. So you have to vary the shape. It's not sphere. Uh, it may not, by the way, there's one other shape where uh, you should. You should read the, 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 the article, which is like this one. It looks like this. That's the Fermi surface lab. It looks like this. It's very interesting. It's open Fermi surface. But it's got a remarkable property that if you take any point here and add pi pi, you will come to a point there. This is called a nested Fermi surface. In this Fermi surface, you have a new instability to forming what's called charge density wave. But then you can show once again, besides my B and my F, there's a new function W. The new function W says take any K you like, any K2 you like, add K1 plus pi, and add K2 plus pi. If these two are on the Fermi surface, those two are on the Fermi surface. And adding pi to any momentum, keeps you on the Fermi surface. So there's one more function that refuses to go away. Then you can see what dw dt is, and you will find it looks like some integral 
www, and you can show that has runaway flow that corresponds to charge density wave instability. But if you draw for me some completely back of any surface, I don't know, I've not thought about that. That's why you guys are here, you can worry about that. I've thought about reasonable Fermi surfaces, including open ones. I wanted to make sure that the discussion between those days with Anderson was, is there something else that can possibly happen that we are not aware of if you turn this Fermi liquid into some other creature? I want to convince myself that every known instability will automatically come out of the RG. And I convince myself, and I can in the end fill at least, you can get all the instability, PCS, CDW, spin density, where everything will come from the RG. So that doesn't mean two-dimensional fermions are fermi liquid. So you can ask, where did this machinery go wrong? This machinery is only perturbative. There's no reason why a perturbative treatment should work. Every perturbation series you write down has a radius of convergence. And if your starting coupling is outside the radius of convergence, you're not going to get that physics by sitting here. That's probably what's happening. But I don't have the cure for that. Yeah, and you're talking about that. Well, we just discussed that the perturbative parameter is G over N because you have to guard it. But you're saying by the time you integrate the chunk, then you get to an effect of G. Maybe if, if your G is off order N by integrating the right. And let me repeat that. It's a very important point. Once I get to a narrow bandwidth, I'm not worried about how big your coupling constants are. There's no longer an expansion in coupling. It is an 1 over n expansion, which is lambda over k. But even by the time I get to there from a big bandwidth, by summing more diagrams, I have to sum an infinite number. If they don't convert, I cannot even get to that state. If that happens, that means physics at higher energies is really affecting the problem in a serious way. <coughs> then I cannot even get to the narrow bandwidth theory. So that's almost certainly what's happening in any fermion in 2D, which is not a fermion. Yes? Uh, can you comment on, is just sort of changes the story at all? Yeah. Uh, I have worked on problems with disorder, especially in quantum dots. Uh, maybe you should just read another review I wrote called Dots for Dummies. That's coming out very soon. <laughs> uh, it's in some already published in the Springer lectures, I think. It tells you how to work with disorder. It's a little tricky. Disorder is always there in every problem, including where lambda theories apply, right? So we can live with small amount of disorder. But technically speaking, momentum is no longer a good label. So you throw up your hands or what can you do? I talk about some of those issues. I think I will stop myself because it's 10.30 and thank you guys for being a pleasure.